Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Mission of Grace Church. I'm Pastor David, and what a beautiful day we have to worship God together. We're alive, we're breathing, and so we come here the first morning of the first day of the week to give him thanks and praise. Amen? Amen. Are you happy to be here? Are you ready to do some work? That is glorifying God together. It's our job. And the psalmist writes this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and do not forget his benefits, who forgives all your inequity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. I love this. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Let us pray. Oh Lord, what we have read is good news. It is great news. It is the best news that you, Lord, do not repay those who are in Christ according to their inequities, that you have removed them from us and satisfied your rightful wrath by the sacrifice of the Christ. Father, we rejoice in these precious truths. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of proclaiming them this morning and at other times. Father, we pray that everyone here today would be hearing you, Lord, be hearing your word preached. We pray, Lord, that you would anoint our speaker. We pray, Lord, that also you would anoint our ears to hear and to do. May we not only be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. And so, Lord, let us worship you today in spirit and in truth. May everything that is done redound to your glory and our eternal good. These things we ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
kingdoms fall When men who hear refuse to pray On rocks and hills and mountains call God's love so sure shall still endure All measure
thank you for each and every giver and each and every gift that's brought forward here this morning. May these gifts be used for your glory to proclaim the gospel of God in Gardner, Greater Gardner, and indeed to the very ends of the earth. Lord, may you bless each and every cheerful giver. And Lord, may you use each one of us, our time, talents, and treasure in perpetuation of the news that is so good and that is so desperately needed by each and every soul on this planet. In Christ's name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Now it's time just to make mention of remembering for tithes and offerings. The needs of this church continue during this remote ministry. And there's a couple of ways that you can remember to give, either by visiting our website, missionofgracechurch.org, or mailing directly to 358 Pleasant Street, Gardner, Massachusetts. This morning, we have a special uh, privilege and treat for you. The conference minister of the 4C, the Conservative Congregational Christian Conference, which we have belonged to since 1970, is here with us this morning. And um, I've, we've had other people in the life of the church, the 128-year life of the church, that have preached, but I don't myself personally know of the conference minister ever coming here to preach. And so uh, we're blessed to have Dr. Ronald Hamilton bring the word to us. Uh, he's a great leader and um, we love him and he is going to help us, of course, install uh, Pastor John McKenzie this afternoon. So would you please uh, warmly, warmly, Greet uh, Pastor and Dr. Ron Hamilton as he brings the word. Thank you, brother. Um, a, couple, a number of years ago, I was asked to do some consulting with a church that was going through a significant change. It was an inner city church that had kind of gone through a generation, and now there was a new group of people, particularly young people of a different ethnicity that had come into that church. And uh, so they, they said, we, we believe we have a future, but we don't know what it looks like. We do come in and spend a few days with us. And uh, so I came and visited along with them and uh, talked to them a little bit about, about what was happening in the church. And they said, well, we have a few problems. And I said, well, tell me about your problems. They said, well, one big problem we have is on Sunday morning. And I said, okay, tell me about that problem. And they said, well, Historically and traditionally in this church, the choir has gathered at the back of the church before we start worship. And then as we announce the first hymn, the choir walks in and everyone stands up. And they said, the problem that we're having is these new kids from the neighborhood don't stand up. Well, I've been working with churches for some time, and I thought, if that's your biggest problem, it's not a huge problem. But I made a suggestion to them. I said, why don't you change the expectations? Why don't you have somebody say, as you begin the service, and the choir is poised at the back, welcome to all of you. We are here today in the presence of the Almighty God, and we expect him to be with us today. And as the choir comes in, will you all stand and join together in worshiping the Lord of Heavens? 
And they did it. And I said, how'd it go? They said, everyone stood up. It was a matter of expectations. You see, one thing that they were doing was simply tradition. And the other thing they were doing was full of the life of God. And so I'm wondering today, if you came into this place expecting God to speak to you, for you to hear his voice. What I want to do today is I want to share with you from 1 Samuel chapter 3, and I'm actually going to read the entire chapter. And I, I want to tell you, it's not really fair just to read this story without giving you a little background. I'm going to encourage you to, on your own, go back and read 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2 to get the background of all of this. You see, the scene is set in, in the, uh, the place where God is, is ministering under a priest named Eli. And here this young man, Samuel, is residing. This all happened because for years his mother could not have a child. And she begged of God that she would have a child. And she went into the temple to worship God and to say, God, please hear and answer my prayer. I want a child. And one day the priest Eli, who is mentioned in this story, looks over and he sees this woman and, and he really wonders if she's drunk or something. Because really, she is so desperate in her prayers that simply her mouth is open and she's uttering something, but there are no words coming out. Desperation from the soul. You go on and you read in this chapter that God answers a prayer. She has a young boy and she names him Samuel. And she's so full with joy that as you read chapter 2, she, she really has a prayer that becomes a song of worship to the Lord. And at that time, she makes a commitment. Lord, this child is from you, and so I'm going to give him back to you. He's going to be at work for you in your temple. And so what she does is she takes him there as a very young baby. She stays with him until he's weaned. And there he is ministering as an answer to God's prayer. Now we come to chapter 3. The title of this chapter is simply, The Lord Calls Samuel. And let me add to it, by name. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of the Lord was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went back and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. My son, Eli, said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet come and been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. And Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli said to Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. And at that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against the family from beginning to end. 
For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible, and he failed to restrain, restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned, will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning, then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And he was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, here I am. What was it that he said to you, Eli asked? Do not hide it from me. May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. And Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. What a story it is. Um, very encouraging, very challenging. Uh, very informative in many ways. You see, the Lord called Samuel by name as a judge and prophet. While we may not hear his audible voice, God still speaks to his people by name, calling them to a life of obedience and service in his work. Well, let's dig into this a little bit and say, what does this really mean to us? What should our expectations be as we come into this place of worship today? First of all, we come to understand that there is a reason why people do not hear the voice of God. We read in verse 1, the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. But all you have to do is dig into the scriptures and you find out what's going on at this time. And it's really typified, and we'll come back to this in just a minute, by the two sons of the priest, Eli. Judges chapter 17 and chapter 21 describe those days. It said, in those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. And again... This is what's happening to Eli, the priest's sons. They are not following the way of the Lord. They are doing what they thought was right in their own eyes, what they saw fit. They were self-indulgent. They were sexually immoral. They did not obey God in any way. That was the context for what we read, in those days the word of the Lord was rare. So I began to dig into this a little bit, and I, I read a commentary by Bill Arnold, and um, he writes these words. Samuel was born in a period of great moral and spiritual crisis. Israelite society had become ethnically, ethically pluralistic, and everyone was doing whatever seemed right in their own opinion. Without righteous leadership, the nation was perilously close to ruin. Immoral decay was leading to social unrest and conflict. And I read that and I thought, if the author would have mentioned inflation, he would have been speaking about 2022. The condition of the world. Let me just read it again. Samuel was born in a period of great moral and spiritual crisis. Israelite society had become ethically pluralistic. Everyone was doing what seemed right in their own opinion. Without righteous leadership, the nation was perilously close to ruin. Internal moral decay, decay was leading to social unrest and conflict. You see, there's a reason why people don't hear the voice of God. It's a lack of spiritual perception. And this goes on for generations. And, and when Jesus comes, Jesus shares these words. Whoever has eyes to see and ears 
to hear. And we need to understand that, that from the beginning of creation, man and woman were created to hear from God and to talk to God. In fact, when we go into Genesis chapter 3, what's happening is Satan is challenging to Adam and Eve the very words that the Lord spoke to them. This you can do and this you can't do. And, and, and he talks to them and he said, is what the Lord told you right? Certainly that can't be right. And so they did what was right in their own eyes. And sin entered the world. And God comes again to the garden and sin broke that relationship with God. And ears that heard were plugged and eyes that saw were closed. And the Lord walked in the garden, and here's what he said to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, where are you? You see, they ran and they hid from God. There is a reason why people don't hear the voice of God. Because they have lost their spiritual sensitivity. And as I come into this place of worship and as I read this scripture with you, I would say, yes, Lord, the description of what's going on around us is very true. We are so much like those days. Lord, may that not be true of me. May I be a person who, when you speak, I hear you. My heart, my mind, my eyes, all that I am is open to you, Lord. Then we come and we see there is a reason why God wants to speak to us. There's some reasons why he wanted to speak to Samuel. He wanted to inform him. He also wanted to transform him. You see, he informed him of something that was going to happen, that it was a judgment that was going to come upon them. And so as he speaks to him, in, in 1 Samuel we read this, the Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. Samuel, I'm going to bring judgment upon this household because of their disobedience. He was informing him. And for you and I, if God's going to speak to us, and he does this in many ways, and we'll talk about this later, he wants to inform us of some things. He wants to help us have an understanding of his will and his way and his actions. But I believe it's more than information, it's transformation that God works. You see, we read in chapter, chapter 3, verse 7, that when God began to speak, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And we won't take a lot of time today to talk about what that means, but that word know is talking about something intimate, something deep, something personal. And Samuel was doing the work of God, but somehow God had not fully transformed him until he heard the voice of God. But then we read at the end of the chapter that as Samuel has this encounter and he hears from God, as Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and he let none of his words fall to the ground. In other words, he's speaking to Samuel and he's saying, Samuel, I'm going to do something. And I'm going to do it in this world in which you live. But also, Samuel, I'm going to do something for you and in you. And so we have this information. But in a greater way, we have this transformation where all of a sudden, here's a person speaking on behalf of the Lord. And the Lord is using him, even a young man, and the society has changed. We must hear the voice of God to effectively know him and serve him in this generation. So where does this leave us? Well, for me, it leaves me with a request, with a desire, that I would be part of something that would be about restoring a culture of hearing the voice of God. 
I lost my parents. Uh, my mom died in uh, 10 years ago, 2012. My father died in 1990. They were both very active in ministry. They were saints of the Lord in my eyes. And they had favorite songs. One of my dad's favorite song that we sang at his funeral was this, In the Garden. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God, discloses. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet, and the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. He walks with me. And he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. And here I am in 22, and I'm reading this story, and I'm understanding that, that the temptation is for me and every believer to be caught up in this culture of doing what is right in our own eyes and, and losing our spiritual sensitivity. And I realize that for me, one generation before me, people live this way. This is the way they actually lived every day, walking and talking with God. And I would say to the youngest here, you know, this would be your, your great-grandpa and grandma. You know, we're not talking about somebody you read about in history books. These are people that are known to us. It wasn't that long ago that, that people actually lived this way. They literally believed that God walked with them and he talked with them. And he told them, you're mine. I'd, I'd love to restore that in my life, in my family, in every place that I go to restore a culture of hearing the voice of God. But I know it will be challenging because this generation, it's so foreign. And so as I was studying and preparing, I, I have commentaries that I dig into. Occasionally I will go to this website called Got Questions. And actually, if you have questions, you know, it's not deeply theological, but it's very helpful. And I wondered today, if somebody said, do people hear the voice of God, what would they say? So I go to Got, Got Questions, and I Google, you know, search, hearing the voice of God. And an article pops up, and it says this, are people who claim to talk to God insane? In other words, our generation thinks this is craziness. <laughs> One generation before, for me, it's the way people lived. Is it crazy? I don't think it's crazy. I don't think it's crazy at all. It goes back, takes me to dig into the Word of God. The Bible talks about God speaking to his people. We have to consider this, and we have to ask, what is God saying? We go to Jesus. And Jesus, as he's gathering his disciples and his followers, he says, I'm the great shepherd, and my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And it would be easy to say, well, that's a metaphor. We're not sheep. We, oh, yes, we are. He's the shepherd, and we're the sheep. And as he's forming this way to the new covenant relationship with God, he's trying to say, this is the way it works. My sheep listen to my voice. They hear me. I know them by name. They follow me. This became ingrained into the early church, and so the apostle Paul writes this, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves 
so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Which is really a paraphrase for what we would say today, Daddy. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The Apostle Paul, as he's teaching in the founding of the church, says this is the way it works. God has called you as his children through the work of Christ. And your sins are forgiven and you have a new life and you are sons and daughters of God. He is your daddy and you can talk to him. And he calls you by name and his spirit speaks to your spirit and reminds you of that every day. In the book of Hebrews, the author is unknown to us, but the late part of the writing of the New Testament said, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did one long ago, a long time later, he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, and he goes back to the Old Testament, and he says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Now, anybody who is theologically oriented will uh, say, well, what does it really mean today? I'm pretty simple. I think today means today. <laughs> and I think the scripture speaks to a generation of, of the Old Testament. It speaks to the New Testament. It speaks to us today. I think the Bible is shouting out to us today. Today, when you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So how do we hear the voice of God? Well, what's our expectation? I hope today that you're sitting here thinking, we have a guest speaker, but there's a different voice. God's speaking to me today by name. You see, through the public preaching of the word, through the personal reading of the word, God speaks. God speaks to us when we pray. And often we miss the teaching of Scripture where really prayer and meditation are linked so closely together. How quickly we are to say our prayers and then get up about life. The Bible teaches us to prayer and meditation. To pray and for us to speak and then to meditate and to allow God to speak. God, what are you saying to me today? God, God speaks to us through other believers, and, and you're a part of a, a body here, the Mission of Grace Church at Gardner. Brothers and sisters in Christ, sons and daughters of God, I, I want to tell you, God will use other people to help you hear his voice today. For you to understand his will and his way for you, let me just tell you a story. I, I uh, was in pastoral ministry for about 40 years. I ended up being the founding pastor of a church in Woodbury, Minnesota, and things were going quite well there, and all of a sudden I get this opportunity to go to work for our conference at that time to take the job as the director of church multiplication. It was, it was a hard ask. It was a tough decision. And I needed to know, is, is this the voice of God or not? So what I did is I, I went and I gathered some friends and mentors, and I went out and I said to them, this is what's going on in my life right now. I've been the pastor of this church for 29 years. I've been in pastoral ministry, and now I'm being asked to, to work for our denomination. And, and there were differing bits of advice that came. And the last person I went to talked to me a little bit about it, and then he said, hey, what does your wife say? And so I went home, and I sat down at our kitchen table, and Shirley came and said, who'd you talk to today? And I said, I talked to Tim. And she said, what did he say? And I said, well, he said, what do you say? <laughs> and he was very interesting, because Shirley said, you know, I'm so glad you asked because I've been observing your life and I've been seeing how God has brought passion in your life for the development of new churches and you've been actively involved in this. 
And she says, I believe this is God's will. And interestingly enough, we both stopped and we broke down crying together. And it isn't because we heard from Tim, it's because we heard from the Lord. God spoke to us that way. So I'm preparing this message and I get up in the morning and I read my daily devotional. And the devotional simply has a verse of the Bible and then a little devotion. The day I write this sermon, the scripture is this, Matthew 13, 9. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And I'm going, oh God, you've got such a sense of humor. <laughs> you know I'm going to stand up there and preach this stuff. And now you're asking me to live it. And so I dig into this devotional. And it says, this is a repeated exhortation on the Lord's lips. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And I, I dig more and it says, hearing presupposes an enlightening work of the Spirit of God in the individual. You see, hearing it actually believes that God's already work. And I'm so happy to hear that you're talking about a season of revival. You know, that, that this is a day in which God is speaking and God wants to work. It says to hear is to feel in the depths where the deep roots go. Deep inside of us, deep inside of me, needs to be that yearning and longing. God, speak to me by name today. God, like you said, Samuel, God, today say, Ron, listen to me. And it ends, it says, it's a hearing that's without allowing the world to distract. In other words, Today, you're going to hear this, and maybe you're going to get all excited about it. You're going to walk outside of here, and you're going to go, hmm. Because you're going to be hit by all the stuff of this world. The day I wrote this sermon, my devotional says, whoever has ears, let them hear. What I'd like to have is just a a music video shared with you that would be my closing prayer for the sermon. It's simply, Word of God Speak. I'm finding myself at a loss for words And the funny thing is, it's okay the last thing I need is to be heard, but to hear what you would say, word of God speak, would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your mouth. myself in the midst of you beyond the music beyond the noise all that I need is to be with you and in the quiet hear your voice word of God speak would you pour Let 
at a loss for words And the funny thing is It's okay today. And Father, help us to live the way you have ordained, the way you have designed. And Father, we so desperately plead with you that the church of Jesus Christ all over this country and all over this world would be revived from the top of its head to the bottom of its feet. We ask you this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. 